Welcome to the NeuroFaith Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Thompson, and we are here to explore what it means to live at the intersection of emerging scientific discoveries about the mind and following and being formed by Jesus and how that can lead us into a world of greater human flourishing. We are eager to hear from our guests not only about the work they are doing, but how it speaks to what it means for us to thrive in our present particular moment. My guest today is Dr. Arthur Brooks. Dr. Brooks is the William Henry Bloomberg Professor of the Practice of Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School and a Professor of Management Practice at the Harvard Business School. Prior to that, for 10 years, he served as the President of the American Enterprise Institute, a public policy think tank in Washington, D.C. He is a contributing writer at The Atlantic and the host of the podcast series, How to Build a Happy Life. He's written several books, including, most recently, From Strength to Strength, Finding Success, Happiness, and Deep Purpose in the Second Half of Life. And on a personal note for me, for two years in his role as the president of AEI, he was our son Nathan's boss. And as we parents say, there are few ways that someone could love me any better than to love my child well. And in that role, Arthur did so in so many ways for which I am forever grateful. Arthur Brooks, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Kurt. What a, what a joy to be with you again. I haven't talked to you in a couple of years at this point. And I've talked to Nathan off and on. I've even seen Nathan in person. And it was, what a joy to see him. He was the just a world-beating research assistant for me. He saved my bacon um, from making mistakes on, on numerous occasions. I have many occasions, I have to say. So I have real gratitude to him, too. Oh, goodness. Well, I will look forward to uh, his being able to listen to this once this is released. Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, so delighted. And for our audience, this has been a long time coming. I'm just really thrilled that we're able to have the opportunity to have a conversation. I, I would love for our audience to get a chance to know, uh, first of all, more about you personally from your sense of things. How would you say that you came to be where you are now? What was it about your early years or even recently that has really influenced your move into this work that you're doing that really is helping us pay a lot of attention to social science realities uh, in really crucially and necessary ways? So that's a, a a big open-ended question, of course, because you, I could take it in a lot of different ways. And I know that you know, I know the spirit in which you intend that question, which is not just how did I wind up studying social science, but what is the why uh, behind it? What's the, the the moral deep purpose of what I'm doing? And that gets back to who I am as a person. Fundamentally, I'm as a man, I'm a I'm a follower of my Lord and Savior. Um, I'm a Christian man. Um, I was raised a Christian in a Christian household um, as. A, uh, in an evangelical Christian household, I converted to Roman Catholicism as a teenager uh, when I was 15 years old after having a mystical experience at the Shrine of Guadalupe, or as so it seemed to me. Uh, I announced to my parents I was becoming Catholic, and they, 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 they didn't like it, but they thought that as adolescent rebellion goes, it was probably better than drugs. <laughs> uh, and so... And so they accepted it, and and uh, it thus began my lifelong adventure as a Roman Catholic. I married a Catholic girl, a non-practicing Catholic girl from Barcelona, and set to work on trying to get her uh, convinced that going to mass would be a good thing to do. It took a few years, but now she's she's the one who's actually doing graduate work in theology. She has a program in native Spanish uh, in on adult evangelization and. Uh, and that, that's really the center of our lives. The, the single most important thing in my life is my Christian faith, um, as probably are a lot of people listening, although not everybody. Now, by discipline, I'm a, I'm a social scientist, but that's not the way it's always been. I started off my career as a classical French horn player, um, touring for a long time for six years, including a couple of years playing with a jazz guitar player, Charlie Bird, around the United States and, and, and a little bit abroad. And then I spent a bunch of seasons in the Barcelona Orchestra. That's actually where I moved to Barcelona. Not that It's not that I met my wife in Barcelona. I went there trying to close the deal to learn the language and convince her to marry me, as a matter of fact, and took a job there to, because I needed to make a living. And then we moved back after marrying, I'm happy to say. The music career didn't last forever, but I'm, I'm sure that the marriage will last until I take my dying breath. 
And, uh, and we moved back to the States. And that's when I went to college in my late 20s. I had not gone to college. Right? I had an ill-fated attempt at college. In my late 20s, I went to correspondence school. And just by sheer serendipity, got really interested in, in economics and, and various sort of behavioral social sciences, which I wound up studying. And then went to graduate school and that left music and got my PhD and became a social scientist. I taught at Syracuse for about a decade. Then I left and ran a think tank in Washington, D.C., where your fantastic son was my research, uh, was my research assistant. I was, I was the president of the American Enterprise Institute for more than a decade. And then, and then I retired. And the reason I retired was because of my research. Um, I did research to figure out what the back half of my life was supposed to look like. And it became very clear in the data. And I listened to the data. I mean, it's, I believe that God created the data. And, and, and you know, if you ask the Lord to let the data speak to you, I believe the Lord will make the data speak to you. And the data spoke to me. And it was a pro- my process of discernment. I, and fundamentally, the, the analysis that I was doing was in concert with a lot of time in discernment on my knees in front of the Blessed Sacrament, asking what I was supposed to do with the back half of my life. And it became clear it was to leave that and to go to write, speak, and teach to lift people up and bring them together in bonds of love and happiness using my intellect and ideas motivated my, in my faith in, in Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm trying to do today. So one of the things that, uh, like I'm even having the experience even now, uh, as we're talking here, that you're not just downloading information about a certain man and a certain set of facts about his life, that you are really talking about uh, a journey. And that journey is one that has uh, affected even me by virtue of the vicarious effect you've had on our son through through that. And and so I, I am also just really uh, struck by the way that the work, that the personal work that you're doing internally and in your life is also shaping so, uh, in, in such a vital way, what you're doing professionally now. And it has brought in many respects, you brought you to this place where you currently find yourself and where you have recently published a book from strength to strength. And uh, I, as I mentioned earlier today, I just finished reading this book and I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty bullish about it. And I've talked to my wife about it, as I mentioned, that we, were, we, we plan to have a couples group that are going to gather together and, and do a study on this. Uh, and I, I, I want to jump right in with this for our listeners, because I, I want our listeners to pay attention to the fact that they're hearing someone speak, not just, again, from 10,000 feet, but they're hearing someone speak who in your very life are also doing the hard work of getting to where you currently are, and that this hasn't been an easy journey, but it's been one that's been worth it. Tell me, I'm, I want to start right off. This, this, this has just been fascinating to me. Uh, not least of which because it is personally significant. I would love for us to hear you talk about what you discovered is the difference between what you call the fluid and the crystallized curves of learning. One of the things that you notice is that there are two kinds of achieve, high achievers. You know, this actually comes from the social science literature from the mid part of the 20th century. There are kind of two sorts of geniuses. And we all have these two types of geniuses within us, but they manifest at different times in different ways. There's the, the excellence that you can attain when you're early in life. And that's the 10,000 hours that Malcolm Gladwell writes about, that you get better and better what you do. And it's always kind of takes the same form, notwithstanding what field you're in, whether you're an electrician or a or a lawyer, or a financial professional, or what, even a bus driver, air traffic controller, you get better and better and better at focusing on a particular task, at cracking particular problems, at analytic capability of computational speed. Uh, people can give you a problem, you can solve it faster than other people. You meet a, a 28-year-old or a 32-year-old electrician, and they're just really good at what they do. They, say, they, look, at, they, look, at, they look at your wall, and they say, oh, it's this, this, and this, and this. And you can tell they have a whole lot of skill and a whole lot of of experience. Now that's fluid intelligence and it goes up and up and up. It goes screaming up and the harder you work, the better it gets and the better you are at your job. And, and, and it's fantastic. And that's what people do. And that's what they think really is their excellence and their vocation professionally is to get really good at this fluid intelligence thing as manifest in their particular line of work that goes up and it tends to peak usually in people's late thirties or at latest early forties. And then it starts to decline. And nobody tells you this. I mean, the, the 10,000 hours literature doesn't say 10,000 hours. I mean, you're going to be the king of the mambo and then you're not. You know, that's it's, – it's, it's really disappointing for people. And this actually what it explains is not the performance you see in others. 
but rather the performance you see in yourself because you're so good at what you do. If you're a striver that nobody will notice that you're not on your game, but you will. And here's the key thing, Kurt. Happiness comes from progress. I mean, we see this all around us, and the neuroscience literature is abundant in explaining this in, in the way that the brain works, but we can see this in our ordinary behavior. Everybody knows that it's actually not that hard to lose weight, but it's almost impossible to keep the weight off. And the reason is because you're hugely motivated when the scale is dropping, but when you get to your goal, the reward is never eating anything you like for the rest of your life. And it turns out that not making progress makes that cost-benefit analysis go upside down and you start eating donuts on that day. And, and the same thing is true with anything else in, in your work. When your work is not getting easier, when you're not becoming more accomplished, when you're not getting better, you don't like it. And this explains a lot of things in life. For example, your, your hotshot dentist that you went to because he was the best dentist in your neighborhood or your community, and you notice that when he's 43, he starts taking Fridays off to golf. You know, he was like passionate about being a dentist. What's up with that? The answer is he can't quite put his finger on it, but he's kind of burned out on being a dentist. And the reason is because he's on the wrong side of his fluid intelligence curve. And he doesn't know it. He just knows that he's not as engaged and he's not getting better, et cetera. And it happens to everybody. And most people can't explain it. Now, the social science literature does explain it, however, and it's been replicated not just by psychologists, but by neuroscientists who have some explanations in the structure of the prefrontal cortex. Now, this is not degradation. This is not the end of the story because that's just the first part of the story. The second part of the story is the, the late blooming genius that comes in behind it, which many people don't know about, so they don't look for. That's called crystallized intelligence, which is increasing in your 40s and your 50s. It keeps going up in your 60s and stays high in your 70s and 80s. And if God gives you your marbles, as long as you live. That's different. That's not processing speed. That's not analytic capability or even working memory. That's wisdom. That's the ability to recognize patterns. That's the teaching capacity. That's the ability to take complex concepts and, and explain them really coherently. That has to do with vocabulary and mentorship and, and, and just the general kind of wise man or wise woman that you would meet. That's crystallized intelligence. And that's a different set of skills and it has a different kind of vocational implications to it. It's a different job is the whole thing. And so here's the deal. If you want to be successful and happy in your work, you need to walk from one curve to the other. That's the key. That means you must change in your focus and what you're doing. Maybe that means changing careers. Maybe that means changing jobs. Maybe that just means changing the way that you do your job. But I'll give you examples. Early on, you're a startup entrepreneur. Fantastic. That's fluid intelligence. Later on, you should be a venture capitalist because then you're actually teaching and coaching and seeing patterns among other entrepreneurs. Early on, you should be a star litigator. Later on, you should be managing partner. Early on, you should be a, uh, an academic researcher at the forefront of your field. Later on, you should be a master teacher. You get the picture. Everybody's got the two kinds of intelligence and they need to find out how to do that. I, I can imagine that there'll be some folks in our listening audience who will say, oh my gosh, this is great information. Now, what I need to know is how is the way that I can be the best jumper from the fluid to the crystallized curve? In some respects, like it's really difficult for me to give up my practice as a fluid, fluidly intelligent person, even as I'm trying to make that move I take my pattern of living with me, even like, so it's like, it's like when people come to me and they want to, you know, it's the whole notion of uh, how they, uh, they come to see me as a patient and they have a particular problem and they, and I, and the way that they practice their life in many respects is how it is that they're in my office in the first place. And what's, and they, and they immediately want to know, how can I be the best patient I can be? I know I'll just do with Kurt what I've been doing with everything else in order to be the best patient, which of course defeats the purpose. And so I'm, I'm wondering, what is it that is helpful even in our paying attention to how we know when that move is going to be helpful for us to make without being anxious about that, yeah. being intentional about it? The most important thing is to be thinking ahead about lots of different ways to do your work and lots of things that you're actually interested in. The key part is thinking not just how can I be better at what I'm doing exactly right now, but to be thinking about 
what am I finding that I'm more interested in? And that means being a, 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 an expansive person who experiences different things such that new interests can capture you. The key thing is actually not to really jump on the second curve, is to let the second curve scoop you up. This is interesting. So there's this whole literature about if you're going to be happier or less happy after you retire. And the literature shows that people, half the people who retire are happier afterward and half the people are less happy. The difference between the two is whether or not you're pushed out of your current job or pulled out of your current job. If you're pushed out, it means I just, I didn't want to do it anymore. I was so sick of it. If you don't have something that you're going to, you're probably going to be less happy after you retire. On the other hand, the people who are happiest after they retire, their job is fine. They they can't afford to keep working because they have so much other stuff that they want to do. They're too busy to keep working. That's the way. And if you're cultivating new interests and exploring new areas and trying new things all the time, you're going to find that that second curve set of skills is going to find you. That's what's going to happen. And you're going to find that you're pulled away from the first curve. That's the sine qua non of excellence is being is being rescued from the first curve because the second curve netted you and brought you over. And the only way to do that is to be a, an, a, an omnivorous, voracious experiencer of new goals, new trials, new interests, interest, new challenges. So, you know, one of the things that you uh, mention is this notion of success addiction. And when we talk about addiction, we talk about withdrawal effects and withdrawal effects having to do with this notion of the discomfort that comes when I turn my attention away from my dopamine surges, when I turn my attention away from my oxytocin surges with which I get immediate gratification and I turn it toward something else that perhaps is a little more boring, a little more difficult, a little more painful to look at. And you culminate this as, as I was reading your book, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I see this whole notion of like addiction that we have to turn away from. But eventually you move the reader toward doing something that of course, uh, all the great wisdom literature suggests we do, which has to do with this notion of being thoughtful about and contemplating, uh, paying attention to our impending death that it's coming at some point. And I can imagine for some of us, the whole notion of making the move from the fluid curve to the crystallized curve feels like it's going to kill me. It's going to, it's going to, I'm going to lose something. Tell us why, tell us what it is about paying attention to death helps us to contemplate that, helps us attune to this and helps us actually accomplish this process that you're recommending that we consider. So there's a lot in that. And the first part about the addiction, I, I know that you've covered this in the show because, you know, this is a, this is a show about faith in neuroscience. And, and, you know, addiction is this very interesting phenomenon. It's something that all of us in this business, you, me, and everybody in between, whether we're academic or practitioners, that you've got to understand this. And it has everything to do with the neurochemistry. And if dopamine is behind every addiction, dopamine is the neurotransmitter of desire, of anticipation, not a reward neurotransmitter, neuromodulator. It's actually an anticipation. So you can, you can even get it if there is no reward, if, it, you know, if, if you're really addicted to something. And what happens is it spits out dopamine to give you all this anticipation, and then it gets vacuumed up into the receptors. And, and what happens is if you're, if you're bombarding lots and lots of dopamine through addictive behavior, you create more and more and more receptors, meaning you got to do the addictive behavior even more, more and more and more and more. Now, you can do that with drugs. You can do that with methamphetamine. You can do that with alcohol. You can do that with gambling. You can do that with pornography, which is one of the nastiest addictions out there just because it has such a big effect on the brain. People think it's innocuous. Pornography is super bad for you because it's so unbelievably addictive. But so is success. Now, the success addiction pattern usually starts in the the following way. Your parents tell you you're the special one. (laughs) And what they're doing is that they're telling you that you're, I mean, they're objectifying you. You're a, you're a little success, little, little Kurt, the success machine (laughs) when you were a kid, right? And, you know, hey, you know, you get a on the mantle. (laughs) <laughs> you're on you're, you know, you get stuff that's, that's, you know, they put up on the, on the refrigerator because of your success, not because of, you know, who you are and not be, I mean, you're, you're a multifaceted little human, but you're, if your parents reward you and objectify you for your success, especially in school or athletics or, you know, beauty pageants or juggling, or in my case, the French horn, you're just going to become a success machine for that. And you're, that's a self-objectifying phenomenon, self-reinforcing phenomenon. And that means you get extra dopamine from the success. You hit the lever, get the cookie, 
get the high, get the anticipation of the reward, and then you start again and again and again and again. And people do this over the course of their lives, and they don't know how to get out of this. They have no concept of actually how to get out of this. And you have to treat it like any other addiction. And now there are a lot of ways to do that. But you've talked about one of the things that I talk about in the book that's extremely effective in doing that, which is confronting the fear that's behind all addiction. Now, addiction is funny. Because addiction is really, uh, it, what it is, is it's a, it's a relationship. You talk to any alcoholic, and deep down, it's their number one love. And so what they want is like, they, they prefer, you know, it's like, uh, they, they would just as soon on their anniversary, go away to a hotel room alone with a bottle of vodka. You know, because that's you know, just like, don't get between me and my true love. And, and the problem is that it, the main reason that people ultimately break up with alcohol is because it's occupying too much of their relationship circuits and, and it's ruining their marriages and it's attenuating the relationship with their kids and their friends and their bosses and everything else in between. It just takes up too much space. It's like a terrible lover who, you know, you know, it's like wants everything and gives nothing at the end. Right. <laughs> and so you, you got to break up sooner or later, but it's really painful to break up. The same thing is true with success that it's a relationship that you have and ultimately, you need to realize that that relationship is dysfunctional and it's really, really harmful, but you're afraid to leave it because you don't know who you are going to be. Now, the success addiction, what it has is the fear that's behind it is the fear of being nobody because you don't know you as not the successful one. Kurt, the successful one. If you, you It's like, okay, who, who is that guy? Who's the guy in the mirror? And you're Kurt afraid to not know Kurt yourself. The writer, yeah, yeah. That is your death fear. That's your death fear. Now, most people are like listening to us. They're like, I'm not afraid of dying. Only 20% of people are really afraid of dying. But everybody has a death fear because your death fear is you not being you. That's it. So if you're afraid of irrelevance, that's your death fear. If you're afraid of being forgotten, that's your death fear. If you're afraid of not being special, that's your death fear. And, and strivers, they all have that specialness death fear. And so what you got to do is you need to contemplate your version of death, study it, just like look at it right in the face. You know, just like alcoholics at Alcoholics Anonymous, they have to say, they have to sit in a circle and say, my name is Arthur Brooks and I'm an alcoholic. Actually, you don't say your, you don't say your last name. My name is Arthur <laughs> and I'm an alcoholic. You never say your last name. And so that's a really important thing. So to do this, you need to stare at your fear. And you need to contemplate it to expose yourself to it. We both know that in the neuroscience literature, exposure therapy is, is very effective at actually accustoming the brain to an experience of a particular cognition. And that's what does it. So what I have is I have adapted, I've adapted death meditations from Theravada Buddhist monks to the, the, to the success addiction. That's what I do in the book so that people can make it not being so special all the time, not such an extraordinarily scary event. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, it reminds me of uh, how frequently we hear in the Gospels of Jesus warning people ahead of the curve that he's going to die and inviting people to pay attention to this. And then we get all the way to Gethsemane. And then we even get to the resurrection and there's still incredulity almost that this has happened. And I, I think for our listeners who, uh, many of whom would say, gosh, we're trying to do everything we can to avoid our death, we're trying to do everything we can to avoid these things. So talk, talk with me about, talk with us about uh, how does our contemplating our death in the way that you're talking about, like approaching it, posturing ourselves in front of it, um, how do we relate that to Yet something else that's very life-giving, which you talk about, which has to do with cultivating your Aspen growth, how does that cultivation help us and invite us into this space where I can say, oh, no, I can, I can do this death contemplation thing? Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's not natural to be thinking about your death. And, and part of the reason for that is that, that we, it's, this is the, this is a dilemma that we have. This is the real problem. I mean, my dog, Chucho, uh, who was a very good boy and who died, he wasn't afraid of dying because he couldn't con contemplate his, his non-existence. He didn't know he was alive. He didn't have consciousness. And so therefore, since he didn't know he was alive, obviously he couldn't realize that he, was, he could be not alive. Now, he would resist death because that's an instinct to be sure. But the consciousness, 
leads us to this unbelievable dissonance as human beings. On the, on the one hand, we know logically, we know as a fact that we're going to die. We know that. But we can't conceive of, because we don't have the capacity, the intellectual capacity to conceive of our non-existence. This is the philosophical dilemma of death, is on the one hand, I intellectually know I'm going to die. On, this, on, the, on the other hand, I cannot conceive of non-existence. And that actually, that cognitive dissonance creates a profound fear. It creates a profound kind of discomfort. And the way that you resolve that cognitive dissonance is by avoiding the very issue, avoiding the inevitability. Now, what that does is it makes a whole lot of bad budgeting decisions in our lives. So, you know, this is one of the things that I'll do to, to you know, I'll ask my students to confront this. And so I'll say, you know, I've got my students, I have 180 MBA students they are on average 27 years old. And I'll say, okay, you're all you're all going to be, you know, the kings of the universe. You're going to make a, you know, gazillion dollars each. I mean, that Harvard Business School, right? They're going to make tons of money. <clears throat> I say, that is not the binding constraint of your life. The binding constraint of your life is your time. So therefore, I want you to think about your budget. And here's how I want you to do it. Tell me how many Thanksgivings you probably have left with your parents. And they're like, whoa, man, Professor Brooks just blew my mind. I never thought about it before. And it's probably like 25, something like that, 30, something like that. And they're like, they've never thought about it before. And I say, are you budgeting correctly? Are you using your scarce resource correctly? Now, that's how you're using your Thanksgivings, obviously. But you can think about the scarce binding resource, which is the not, the, this is not a generating resource. We can't, I mean, look, as Christian people, People, we believe that actually <laughs> it doesn't end at death. But the point is life on earth ends on death. And that's how we need to be thinking about that. Okay. So under the circumstances, we need to, this is one of the ways that we can confront the, the reality that we can, we, we have to resolve the cognitive dissonance with reality as opposed to unreality in this particular way. And the best way to do that is, is together. You know, this is the key. You know, it's this is not a walk, this scary walk through the the you know the verities of life shouldn't be done alone. It's like walking through a, a forest path at night. Do it with a friend, you know, do it with your brother, do it with your parents, do it with the people that you actually love. And that's what actually gets to the one of the most important concepts in the book. There are happy people and unhappy people who get older. The unhappy people stay on the first curve. The unhappy people, they keep trying to add to their life as opposed to trying to take things away from their life. There are people who try to do things all on their own. You know, they look at that first psalm, you know, the, the, for the beautiful elegy of King David to the righteous man. He, he's like a, a tree planted by streams of water, you know, alone, perhaps lonely, but solid and healthy and with beautiful leaves, and that imagery. And what they don't understand is that that, that tree also has roots, man. And, and if you look at something like the aspen tree, which I think is maybe the most beautiful tree in North America. It's literally not one tree. It's the, the roots actually connect every Aspen Grove and they're one plant. Every Aspen Grove is one plant. The world's largest living organism actually in the history of the world is alive today. It's called Pando and it's an Aspen Grove. that's 106 acres, 6 million kilograms of, of wood in Utah. And that's the way to think about it. That's the way to think that we are, that Kurt and Arthur are not like, and fundamentally we're, we're brothers, but we're also, you know, we're, the Buddhists say that it's emptiness to think that we're individuals. And as Christians, we think about that in a different way. But the point is that the metaphor really works in this way. And thinking about the interconnectedness that we get makes it much easier for us to walk this strange and foreign and 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 you know, uh, um, impossible to understand and, and utterly ineffable in its mystery, you know, set of experiences in life that God gives us. I am uh, I, I'm I'm struck by what we in, in some of the work that I do. We we talk about these confessional communities that we that we run in our practice. This notion, in which in many respects. Uh, an, another way for us to describe this would be that we are trying to cultivate aspen groves in many respects. That's exactly what we're trying to cultivate in those in these communities. And even when we are encouraging people to do this, even when people have had now experience of being in one of these communities in which they are actively, uh, generatively cultivating these relationships, they still continue to have moments where it feels difficult to do this. 
And I'm, I'm struck by how even when we uh, do have connected relationships, those connected relationships don't absolutely deliver us from our fear. They don't absolutely deliver us from our, from our suffering. Uh, but one thing that you talk about, you, you when, when you talk about from a practical standpoint, both in terms of your experience, this is, I, I think this, this, I mean, there are many elements of your book that have captivated me, but I think that the, the chapter that really has my attention, and I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, when you talk about finding your vanaprastha, or mm-hmm. what, 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 or I, I, you, you, you'll be the better one to pronounce that. But no, I, you did I would it correctly. Love, that was absolutely right, Kurt. I would love for you to talk with us about that particular mission, that particular vision for how that can utilize our Aspen Grove, help us to do the work that you're talking about. And what's so important about that stage of life? So one of the things that I'd like to do um, as a social scientist is that I don't read a a new piece of research and take it on face value. Um, And the reason is because you know, we've seen the empirical literature. There's a lot that can go wrong that can give you spurious correlations in the data. Not to mention the fact there's all kinds of incentives for academics to publish outlandish results. I mean, I've seen papers that say that conjugal infidelity is one of the secrets to happiness. Well, you know, I'm not an idiot. I wasn't born yesterday. That doesn't even pass the giggle (laughs) test. Everybody knows that's wrong. But, you know, it got through a bunch of referees because it's outlandish. So when I'm looking at at the results in the in, in in the world of the social science of happiness, I, I I steel man everything by looking at things to make sure everything is replicated and looking at things through different data sets, different people with different experiences at different times, different researchers, ideally in different countries. But I also like to steel man these things with different philosophical and even with different wisdom traditions. The way to, to formulate a hypothesis in the science of happiness is to go back to the people who are best at the at the questions in life the big questions in life. And that's the theologians and the philosophers um, of, you know, from old and new. The philosophers are best at that. The theologians and spiritual teachers and philosophers, they're the best at the questions. So that's where you get the big questions. Then you're looking for a mechanism of action. That's where neuroscience is getting really good. Now, neuroscience is a brand new, a brand new discipline. 40 years ago, there were no neuroscience departments in the United States. You had neurobiology and you had neurology and they were sort of a subspecialties in different, you know, in medical schools, et cetera. But now almost every good university has a neuroscience department. You can study it, but it's so new that they don't agree. You get two neuroscientists, you have four conflicting opinions. I mean, right. does a limbic right. system exist? We don't know. You know, <laughs> is there a triune brain? Some say yes, some say no. You know, what is actually the, the, the nature of, you know, the, the stress response? Does it come from the adrenal glands or does it come in the brain in the locus ceruleus? We don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. Everything is difficult and all that. But the mechanism of action can actually start to be explained there. The explanation for it then comes from the social science, from the behavioral economics and the social psychology, et cetera. And then you actually take it out into the management implications and the behavioral implications and all the stuff you're doing with your patients. Here's how you use it, guys. You know, be fruitful and happy by by actually turning this into actual cause of action. That's how all of my that's how all of my work goes. So when I'm doing research on these big topics, one of the things that I like to do is go study with philosophical and spiritual masters outside of my tradition. So I don't just go and talk to priests and monks and Catholic lay people. I talk to evangelical brothers and sisters like you. I talk to Jews and I, I go to imams and, and I travel a lot in India. I have a longstanding relationship with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I ask him the same questions and we work together on the same questions that I'm working on as a Christian man, as a social scientist, even though he's neither. And one of the, on one of my recent trips as I was doing this work about the second, first and second curves I was studying with a, a, a um, Hindu teacher in the south of India in Tamil Nadu, which is the you know the st- extreme southern part of India, with a teacher named Sri Nochar Venkatraman, who is a, a very well known Hindu guru, but who's not well known in the West because he's not a fame seeker, he's not a real rock star, he doesn't you know advertise on the sides of buses and you know bring you know techies that are looking for in their next new startup ideas to do a you know a, he's actually a wonderful spiritual man who intensely loves God. And so I, and I, it was very hard to get an audience with him because it, you know, it's like another Westerner. Yeah. Anyway. So 
I, I, I finally met with him, you know, I, in, a, in a little house in a town called Palakkad in a rural area. I drove for four hours, you know, almost hit a goat. And, and you know, I, I at the house, you know, I take off my shoes and I go in. I don't know where I am. I'm very disoriented, very jet lagged. And he's waiting for me with this surrounded with his followers. And he looks at me and he, with a sign of namaste and he says, I've been waiting for you. I mean, it was like TV. I mean, it was, it was, and, and what I asked him about was this first and second curve theory of modern Western social science. He says, oh yeah, we've been talking about that for 6,000 years. I said, wait a second, what? I said, he said, oh, that's the theory of the ashramas. And I said, what is that? He said, according to ancient Vedic wisdom, the ashramas are the four equal quarters of a good life. They're, they're ideally 25 years long, but not necessarily, as you know, we like to say in the West, your results may vary. He says the first is called brahmacharya, which is the student phase of life. The second is grihastha, the householder phase, where you form your family and go to work and make money and have children. And, and, and he says most people get stuck in grihastha. You know, that is the first curve, man. That's grihastha. He says, but then you have a second adolescence and you need to make a, a shift into vanaprastha, the third quarter of a good life. Vanaprastha comes from two Sanskrit words, van and prastha, meaning retiring into the forest. Now, it doesn't mean that literally. I mean, it's obviously a metaphor. The whole idea is pulling back from the exigencies of daily life and what you used to be good at to be looking more spiritually, more, more deeply at how you can serve, how you can teach, how you can worship, how you can love. Those are the big questions of Anaprastha. And you can't do it when you're distracted. And so this is what strivers have in common. They're highly distracted. Look, you don't want to see somebody who's really distracted? Look at an addict. They're unbelievably distracted. A success addict times 10. So that's what you need to do is to break that success addiction, to go from the first curve to the second, is to go from Grihastha to Vanaprastha. And here's the best part of this whole way of thinking. The fourth quarter, according to ancient Vedic teaching, is called sannyasa. You know, many people listening to us, they'll know that the word sannyasi means an enlightened person. Sannyasa, the fourth quarter, is one completely dedicated to the intense love of God. That's what it is. But you can't do it unless you're trained. That's like going to the Olympics 60 pounds overweight if you don't do it. And that's why Vanaprastha is so important. That's why you need to retire into the forest to, 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 have a, to understand your values and your morality, to have a contemplative practice, to read the wisdom literature so that you're ready at 75, so that you're ready to, see to the, sit at the foot of your master. And for me, you know what that means? It's interesting. I meet all these Catholics. They're like, yeah, I know. When I retire, I'm going to go to mass every day. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> I'm going to pray my rosary every day. No, you're not because you're not trained. And so when right. I did this, I thought, oh man, part of my second curve professionally is also going to mass every day and saying my rosary every day because I'm in elite training for the last quarter of my life, which should be dedicated completely to the love of God. Uh, over, over the course of the arc of this series, we've looked at different developmental stages and we've had different researchers that have helped us pay attention to what we're doing with childhood and adolescence and young adulthood and so forth. And this work that you're doing uh, could not come at a more important time. It, uh, I, th I think about the number of those of us right now in our culture's current moment who, uh, by all means, we would want to be people of wisdom. We would want to be people who are actually able to offer those around us that which can lead to beauty and goodness rather than to chaos and rigidity and violence that we see so often. And I just want to thank you so much for uh, joining us and for your voice uh, now getting the opportunity to be heard by so many. Uh, your book, From Strength to Strength, I just want to say to our listeners, uh, not just to buy a copy, but to buy 10 copies and give it to <laughs> nine of your friends. And whether you're 35 or you're 55, uh, it would be a, a great thing for you to be getting your hands on and not just reading it, but putting it into practice. And also then to have the opportunity to listen to Arthur and his podcast. Uh, the last thing I do want to say is I got to find a way to get me one of those t-shirts. Our, our, our listeners can't see, but like you, like I, I know from, from your, from your book, real friend is bigger than, than deal friend. I love that. Yeah. I got to find a way to get me one of those t-shirts. Yeah, no, we're, we're actually, it's a, I have a, I have a, you know, the, my, the, the people who work with me, they're convinced that we need merch. And so they oh, made, yeah. made a right. copies of the t-shirts. So we're going to be rolling out a line of t-shirts that says real friend, 
uh, greater than sign for deal friend because real friends be deal friends all day long. But what does it? What does the success have? Success addict have a lot of deal friends, not so many real friends. Right on, Arthur. Thank you so much. It's been a joy to be with you. Uh, just appreciate your life and the work that you're doing and continue to do. And we look forward to perhaps uh, having you on this podcast again in the future. Thank you, Kurt. Thanks for the work you're doing to lift people up and bring them together using these standards of science, but remembering that as Christian people, or by the way, people of any religious tradition, that faith and reason are not only not in conflict, but that iron sharpens iron and nothing could make both faith and reason more beautiful than each other. Right on. Thank you so much. Thank you. You've been listening to the NeuroFaith Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kurt Thompson. And today, my guest has been Arthur Brooks. I look forward to your joining us for our next episode as we continue our journey to explore life at the intersection of neuroscience and the light of following Jesus. Until then. Mm-hmm.